We need some special music. Well, I was on the schedule, but I'm doing the preaching, so I'm not doing the singing too, not tonight. Uh, we should have some teenagers come on up. And uh, teens, I can't be deceitful like this. They did practice this. I told them, we're going to just call them up like they haven't practiced. And you'd be like, whoa, they did a good job. And uh, so teens, I can't even remember who all you are. Let's see. Nolan and Sadie, you're up here. All right, Haley and Savannah's up here. Lillian's up here. Brendan's up here. John Mark's coming up. Bryce is coming up. And uh, is DJ, did DJ make, did, 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 did make it in? All right, all right DJ? They've, they've, all, they've voted you uh, in, DJ. And uh, you could do it. You know what it is. How many want to hear DJ come up here and sing? You want to do it? Yeah, come on, DJ. Come on up. Come on up. Yeah, you got voted, man. You're like president of the United States now, all right? And uh, come on up, teen, young people. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. And, uh, oh, Lean, Lean's going to play. And uh, anyway, we're going to, they're going to, they're going to sing, they're going to sing a song for you. And they said they would do it if I sang with them. So uh, I'll, I'll stand in the background here. And uh, grab your mics. Got your microphones? got these two corded ones in the middle, Mr. House? I don't know. Testing, testing. You see a green light coming on? See a green light coming? There we go. That's on. You got the other one? Yeah, it's on. That's on there. You got it there? All right. You got it For a long time I traveled Down a long lonely road My heart was so heavy And sin I sang long Then I heard about Jesus What a wonderful hour I'm so glad that I found out He would bring me out to His saving power Thank God I am free, free, free from this world of sin. Washed in the blood of Jesus and been born again. Hallelujah and sing, sing, sing by His wonderful grace. I'm so glad that I found out He would bring me out and show me the way. Like a blind man that God came back his side. Like a poor wretched beggar without fortune and fame. I'm so glad that I found out he would bring me out in his holy name. Thank God I am free, free, free from this world of sin. Washed in the blood of Jesus, been born again. Hallelujah, I'm saved, saved, saved by His wonderful grace. I'm so glad that I found out He would bring me out and show me the way. I'm so glad that I found out He would bring me out and show me. All right, good job, young people. <clears throat> I was glad they do that because it would ruin my illustration. Pulpit one, there we go, there we go. Get your Bibles open in Numbers chapter 14, Numbers chapter 14. And uh, I don't have many notes, I don't have many notes, but they're very detailed, so that's a good sign. So if I don't have many notes and they're detailed, that means it should be a shorter sermon tonight. So, um, but that doesn't always happen. So uh, I have a truth tonight I want to give you. And uh, that special, uh, that was, I told them about that tonight during choir practice 30 minutes before church. Now that took some courage. That did. That took some courage. And uh, I was, none of them even, none of them even argued it. They're just like, well, okay, we'll try it. And if we don't think it sounds good, we won't sing. I was like, okay, that's fine. It's up to you. 
And uh, by the time they were done, there wasn't one complaint about it. And uh, they did a good job. So th- there's a lot of things in life that are good things that come about because of courage. I mean, think about it. Think about it. We're going to talk about courage a little bit tonight. And uh, Numbers chapter 14 and verse number 1 uh, and 2. We'll read them and then we'll pray and we'll get started. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And let's pray. Father, pray to help us tonight. Uh, we want to be, be a blessing to you. We want to make you smile with how our hearts uh, soak up your word. And I pray that tonight we'd make some decisions to, to better ourselves in a way that would make you happy, and that would please you with what we do. Amen. Now, We need to start out with a joke, because I found some good baseball jokes. Sorry, you got to hear? All right. So first one. Um, Did you hear? L.A. is building a new stadium at an undisclosed location. They're keeping it a secret because they're afraid the Dodgers might find out and try to play there. There we go. Yeah, offend all you Dodgers, okay? And then, uh, why is it so hot at Angels games? Because there are no fans. All right. I thought those are two pretty good ones there. <laughs> and had to split the had to split the teams up there. Uh, anyway, courage, courage. This story here, Numbers chapter 14, is right at the end of the story of the 12 spies. The Israelites had just spent almost uh, over a year getting from Egypt to Kadesh Barnea. During this time, they had they had crossed the Red Sea. Uh, they had gotten manna. They had gotten quail. They had gotten uh, the law, the Ten Commandments and the law from Mount Sinai. They had gotten the instructions to build the tabernacle. They had built the tabernacle. They had all their worship set up. A lot went on during this time. It wasn't just 30 days and they're there. It was quite a while before they got there to this Kadesh Barnea, which is at the southern end of Israel between the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea. And they are camped there. And somebody got this bright idea of sending in 12 spies, one from each of the tribes into the land of Canaan. These 12 spies went in and spied out the land, and they came back with all sorts of good reports, amazing reports. They said that the cities are amazing, the fruit trees, the orchards, the vineyards, the crops, everything is great. Everything's just about to get ripe. That means as soon as they go in, they will have ripe fruit and fields ready to pick, and they didn't have to do any of the work. I mean, this is what God says here. This is pretty amazing. They even brought back a sampling of the goods. It surely, in verse 27 of chapter 13, it says, We came into the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. And they're showing the fruit. This is the fruit here. And they come back, those 12 spies, and then 10 of them got to put a damper on everything. And they say, Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Now, the Anakims were giants. They had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. Just when you get home, take your shoes off, look at your feet, and think what they'd look like with six toes. Just just do it. I'm serious. Just do it. It's it's hard to imagine. They had six toes on each foot. Uh, But they were huge. They were giant people. And the Amalekites were there, and they were a very strong warrior-like people. The Hittites, the same. The Jebusites, all these people were very strong, very ferocious warriors. And uh, then you have the story of Caleb and Joshua standing up, Caleb standing up and, and Joshua along with them. And they, they, they took that, 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 uh, that negative that had been put on by the 10 people and they tried to revive and they said, no, let's go, let's do what God wants us to do. And the end of the story is the people speak of stoning Joshua and Caleb and Moses and Aaron. And uh, they say, no, we will not go. We will not go into the land. We should have just died in Egypt. We would have been better off. Now, I'll tell you what caused this spirit, what caused this spirit was fear. It was fear. It was fear. Now, there is courage and there is fear, and they are opposites of each other. To be courageous does not mean you are afraid. It just means that you went on when you were afraid. 
To be fearful means you let your fear keep you from doing what you knew you were supposed to do. So we're going to get those definitions very straight here. In life, you can hear a lot of different stories, a lot of war stories, a lot of stories just in society of families, of situations where there are very rough times. If you go back during the Great Depression, you hear lots of stories about people who had great courage to face very difficult situations, and though they were afraid and though they didn't see how something was going to happen, they went on and pursued what they knew was the right thing to do. That is courage. There are other people who gave up. There were men who walked out on their families because they'd rather walk out and not know what's going on rather than sit there knowing they couldn't provide for their homes, and that is fearful. Their fear keeps them from doing what they know they're supposed to do, and in this story here, We see Joshua and Caleb standing up with great courage at the end here, saying, no, yes, there are giants. Yes, there is difficulty. Yes, their cities are walled. And yes, it will be ferocious battles. But God's the one who said he'd fight for us, and we just need to go on ahead, even though it might be scary, and go conquer the land that God promised to us. And the rest of the people said, no, 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 we can't do it. We can't do it. And they argued back and forth. Finally, they said, kill those two guys. And uh, they almost, almost got stoned, and God steps in. Moses gets up with the power of God all over him, and he tells those people, here's what God has said. You're going to spend the rest of these 40 years wandering till every last one of you over 20 is dropped dead. And he did it. He did it. He did it. We're going to go through some verses here, and we're going to talk about courage. And uh, we're going to talk about some things of why be courageous. Now take your Bible, turn to Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. There are reasons to be courageous. And it's not so you can be the hero, by the way. You won't find anybody who is lifted up as a hero who is courageous who did it for the applause. They did it because it was right. Many of them did it and died in the task. Many of them did it and went through horrible situations because it was the right thing to do. And most of them did it for others. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9, God's instruction to Joshua. Moses has died now. And uh, nobody knows where Moses' body got buried, by the way. If you read in Jude, uh, the devil and uh, Michael, the archangel, fought over the body of Moses. Why? We don't know. But interesting thought for the night. All right, Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, talking to Joshua, be strong and of a good courage. Next line, be not afraid. Neither be, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. God's telling Joshua here, you've got to have courage. And though there may be some fear, you cannot be afraid. You cannot let your fear keep you from doing what I have told you to do. You can't let your fear keep you from leading the people in the way that I've told you to lead them. At the end of Joshua, in Joshua 23, 6, Joshua says here, Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand hand or to the left. Even in Psalms, you get the instruction, Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Just a little later in Psalms, says almost identical thing in another verse. And then Psalm 78, it repeats what happened in Kadesh Barnea with the Israelites. In Psalm 78, 41, yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Now, the very first reason reason why we need to be courageous and have courage as we go through life is because God is the one who does the work and he cannot fail. That is the absolute number one reason. When you get faced with a situation of right, of you know you're supposed to do it, you know it's what God wants you to do, it may be scary, it may be a difficult situation, it may be something you've never done before, it might be something and all brand new, the reason you need to boost up, bolster up your courage and go on and do it is because God's the one who does the work. It's not you that does it. It's not me that does it. It's not the bus workers that do it. Not the bus captain that does it. Not the Sunday school teacher that does it. Not the pastor that does it. It's God who does the work and God cannot fail. Now, I will tell you when God, so to speak, fails, God fails when the Israelites turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. When God does not come through in a situation, a lot of the times it's because we didn't have the courage to see it through and let God use us to accomplish a goal. That's why fear is so bad in our lives. And we all have this. We all face the situation where we know we should do something, and out of fear or insecurity, we decide not to do it. 
And afterwards, usually, we are so convicted in our hearts, we, oh, I'm, next time I'm not going to do it. And the next time comes around, take, take soul winning. You walk by and you see somebody walking down the street, oh, I'm going to talk to them. Oh, but they're, I'm right here at the door. And, oh, I'll just knock on the door. And if they're still out there, I'll talk to them. By the time you get done knocking on the door, they're gone. <sighs> All right, I'll probably see them again. I'll see them again. And then ne- next week, you see the exact same person walking down the street. And you go up and you start looking. They go, oh, they're kind of scary. I don't know. They just got off a of Harley. I like Harleys, by the way, but nothing against Harleys. But you know what I'm talking about. They got their, all the leather on. They got the tattoos all up the arms. They got, they got just the right just the right amount of facial hair that makes them look tough. And uh, you know, you think, ah, oh, they don't want to hear about it anyway. And uh, you let your fear keep you from going and witnessing to somebody, and you fail that time too. And the next time comes around, and it's just, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a 20-year-old college student. And you think, oh, they're a college student. Uh, they probably don't want to hear. So you don't talk to them either. We struggle with this all the time. We do this. And uh, we let fear keep us from doing what God wants us to do. And I wonder how many times God is limited by us because we're, we're just fearful sometimes. And when instead of being fearful, we've got to be courageous. We've got to boost up the courage. So God is the one who does the work, and he cannot fail unless we let fear keep us from doing what God wants us to do. Take your Bible, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 10. 2 Samuel chapter 10. 2 Samuel chapter 10 here. This is a story. It's a great story. I do not like this man. This man is Joab. I do not like him at all. I do not like him, Sam I am. Okay. All right. I don't know why that popped in my head, but Dr. Seuss. Okay. Uh, Let's see. 2 Samuel chapter 10 and verse number 12. Actually, let's go back up to verse number 8. Uh, seven. And when David heard of it, there's, they're about to be attacked, he sent Joab and all the host to the mighty men. And the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the entering end of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah and of Rehob and of Ishtab and Maaka, 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 Muka, I don't know, uh, were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose of all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. Now, if you want to if you want to make a Bible story into a movie, this would be an amazing movie. I'll tell you that right now. It would be a bestseller. It, it would, uh, it would, I don't know what all the terms are. It would sell out everywhere. All right, this would be awesome. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, they're there. They're in the middle of this fight. David sent them out with all the choice men of Israel. That's all the top-notch soldiers there. And they, get, they go out to fight the Syrians, and they're going to fight the children of Ammon, and they find themselves surrounded. you got the Ammonites on one side. you got the Syrians on the other side. Israelites are in the middle. They're outnumbered. And so Joab tells Abishai here in verse, in verse, number, uh, in verse number 12, in verse number 11, he said, if the Syrians be too strong for me, then thou shalt help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. And if they're both too strong for both of us, then anyway, it doesn't, doesn't even address that. But look at verse number 12. Joab tells Abishai, be of good courage and let us play the men for our people. And for the cities of our God, and the Lord do that which seemeth him good. Now, there's another reason to have courage. Here's another reason to take that extra step outside your comfort zone. Here's another reason to take that extra step beyond what you've done before and done in the past, not what you're what you're comfortable with. It's because not only is God the one who does the work, and we can have confidence it won't fail, but others need you to be courageous. I'll tell you this right now. You've got boys and girls living in your house. They need you to be courageous, mom and dad. You've got young people around you watching you. They need you to be courageous because they aren't old enough to have the courage that they need to make it in life. So they need people older than them to step up and take the challenge and bolster, bolster up, boost that courage inside of them to go and do the things that they know that they're supposed to do. When young people see the, the, the examples uh, kind of fearful in situations, it's not good for them. It's a... Uh, it's, it's taking, it's back to this, it's always soul winning illustrations to me. I think I, st- I struggled with that in high school. Got into seventh grade, started going out teen soul winning, and I did not want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to talk to, I didn't want to talk to, I didn't care how old they were. I didn't want to talk to a three-year-old. I didn't want to talk to a 30-year-old. I didn't want to talk to a teenager. I didn't even want to talk to the, my partner sometimes. I just didn't want to talk to anybody. And so I'd go, we'd go out, and if it was ever, you know, you don't want to look bad, though, because that's the biggest thing with us. Can we all be honest? We don't want to look bad. That's, it really is our biggest fault. We don't want to look bad. And so, like, hey, if this is your door, okay, touch the doorbell. Don't push it. 
All right, nobody's home. All right, track on the door. Until somebody opens the door on their way out, and you scare them, and they scare you, and everybody's scared. And that's happened, too. But that's, it happens. You let fear keep you from doing. But I remember, it was about ninth, 10th grade. I thought, this is ridiculous. I'd gotten partnered up with a junior hire. And so now it's, back to, now it's back to me looking bad again. I don't want to look bad. Nobody wants to look bad. It's like, so I'm going to tell the seventh grader he's got all the doors? Oh, yeah, that looks great. High schooler tells the junior higher, you're talking at every door, kid. All right, so it just can't do that. And so uh, I just got to do it. I got to do it. Because you know what's right. You know what you're supposed to do. And you go out, and somewhere deep inside, you get just enough courage. You ring the doorbell. God, please help no one be home. But then somebody comes to the door. You hear them. You're already resigned to it. You know it's going to happen. They open the door, and all of a sudden, after two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, it's not a big deal anymore. Why? Because that bit of courage that you had got you over the edge. And if you get over the edge, it's fine, but there's others that need you. There's others that look up to you. There's others that see you as you go through life. First Chronicles 19, 13, it's the same story, a little different phrasing here. It says, be of Job says to Abishai, be of good courage and let us behave ourselves valiantly for our people and for the cities of our God and let the Lord do that which is good in his sight. Job basically said, look, let's be valiant. No matter how it turns out, we will be somebody that is talked about later. We may go down fighting in this, but if we go down fighting in this, we will make the history books. They will talk about us for years. We will be lifted up as an example, and people are going to be following our example the rest of their lives, the rest of our history. Now, they didn't die, and God did deliver them, and they did go down as one of the good stories about Joab in in history in the Bible. But they were courageous, and they did right, and they pushed through instead of running away in fear because they had men following them. They had people looking to them. They had families trusting in them. They had a leader that was leaning on them and their help, and so they had to behave themselves valiantly. They couldn't be afraid. They had to have courage, and in spite of fear in their heart, they had to step up and show the example of we are going to go through, and we are going to do this, and no matter how it turns out, and we're going to let the Lord do that which is good in his sight. We're going to trust God. So God is the one who does the work, and he cannot fail. Number two, others need you to be courageous. Number three, there's a great work for God that needs done. There is a great work for God that needs done. First Chronicles 22, 13 is David talking to Solomon, saying, Then shalt thou prosper if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage, dread not, nor be dismayed. And then First Chronicles 28, verse 20, six chapters later, David said to Solomon, his son, Be strong and of good courage, and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. These two verses are all at the geared around, one's at the beginning, one's at the end, of David commissioning Solomon to build the house of God. This is all about the temple that was going to be built in Jerusalem. David's telling him, oh, I've saved up all this gold for you. I've saved up all this silver for you. We've got, we've got the, the uh, King, King Ty- Ty- Tyrus, I think his name is, bringing down cedar, cedar trees for you to use to build the temple with, and it's all going to be beautiful. It's all planned out. I've got the designs. God showed me what he wants to do, and you've got to do it. And Solomon's thinking, Whoa, uh, what is, how long have you been planning this, Dad? Why haven't you told me about any of this? A lot's going on. And David says, Solomon, don't worry about it. Look, just go through with the plan that has been given to you. It's all laid out. You know what you're supposed to do. Don't be afraid. Take good courage. Don't fear. Don't be dismayed. Just take the plan that is given to you. Take the provision that has been given to you. Take what you have and go and do the will that God has given you to do. And you know what God tells us to do? God says, look, I've got the plan right here. I've got the provision that I've promised to you. I've got everything that you need to do the will that I have for you. So be strong and have a good courage. Don't be dismayed. Don't fear. And just go out and do the will that I have for you to do. We've got to be courageous because there's a great work for God that needs done. And if the Christians don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. In fact, God tells us he's not going to send the angels to do it. He tells us that he's not going to raise up uh, a 
zombies aren't going to do it. I mean, who else could? The Democrats aren't going to do it. The Republicans aren't going to do it. Who's going to do it? The Christians are going to do it. But if the Christians don't take courage to get up and do what God wants them to do, and they're not, if they're not going to be strong, and if they're going to let fear keep them, if they're going to let dismay keep them from doing what God wants, the work cannot be done. We end up being the one that limits God in his work. Last thing here, God is looking for a man. God is looking for a man. God is looking for a lady. Ezekiel twenty two thirty, the famous verse here, and I sought for a man among, turn over there, I want you to read here. Ezekiel 22, verse 30. Ezekiel 22 and verse 30. And there's another story here. The prophet Oded, the prophet, went out to see Asa in 2 Chronicles 15, and he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while ye be with him. If ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. And he goes on, tells him a little bit more. In verse number 8, it says, When Asa heard these words in the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. This was a man who was a good king. But this good king was letting fear keep him from taking a stand against all the evil that had crept into the land. And he was really worried about what the people would do and would they follow and would they throw a fit and would they kick me out? Would I be assassinated? How am I going to work with this? And Obed the prophet stood up in the middle of everybody proclaiming it publicly and he told Asa, Asa, just be strong and take courage and do what you know you're supposed to do. And Asa got courage from Obed because Obed decided to be the man that God used and that transitioned over to Asa to be the man that God used and God is always looking for a man and Asa went through and cleaned house he cleaned out all the abominable idols he cleaned out all the rotten stuff that had come in he cleaned out all the bad things that were there and he renewed the altar the Lord set up worship again Ezekiel twenty two thirty. God says and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it but I found none one of the saddest verses in the Bible he wasn't looking for a hundred men. He wasn't looking for ten men. He wasn't looking for a thousand. He was looking for one man, just one man, to stand up and to stand in the gap and to make up the hedge. Just one man to say, God, you know what? I may be afraid what everybody else may think about me. I may be afraid of what people will do and what people will say. I may be afraid of what my family, how my family will respond or react to my decisions. There's some fear there of what's going on, but God, I know it's the right thing to do. And God says, you're the man or you're the woman that I'm looking for that's going to stand up and take a stand because just like Obed took a stand and Asa followed, when you take a stand, somebody will follow along as well it's a domino effect one person stands up another person stands up you can see it in politics today you see these parent teacher meetings against with the school board and uh, you see one person taken up and just giving them a piece of their mind and then everybody else gets fired up and they're giving a piece of their mind if you haven't seen those watch them they're, they're amazing and uh it's great here and it's happening all over the place you get people standing up taking courage and they're scared to death and they're all shaking and nervous and they get going they get their notes out and they're just giving these people the facts of what's right and what's wrong and telling them what their job is. And it's the people putting the position, people in position out of their position and saying, get in your spot and let us be a part of this. It's just, it's great. But you see that when people take a stand, other people follow. You hear all through the Bible, you have Noah facing down the scoffers and proclaiming the judgment of God, God saying, God is going to destroy the earth with a flood. And people made fun of him, but he constantly looked them in the face and said, no, you can repent and turn to God and you can be saved or you can stay in your wicked ways and not believe and you can scoff. But God is God and God will do what God is going to do regardless of how you feel about it. And Noah stayed strong and stayed faithful for those hundred years. You have Joseph standing against Potiphar's wife in the wiles of the charm of the temptation. And he tells her, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He wasn't worried about hurting her feelings. He wasn't worried about repercussions. He was worried about what God was going to think about him and what God was going to treat him, how God was going to bless him and God's blessing towards him. And so Joseph took courage and took a stand against something that could have been so easily given into. Moses, with a shepherd's staff, invaded the court of Pharaoh, who's, who was considered a god on earth with the greatest army the world had ever seen and he looked Pharaoh in the face and said let my people go I mean can you imagine that 
He stood right before Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, let my people go. Now, Moses is 80 years old, and who knows how old Pharaoh was. They could have known each other. I don't know. But still, in that society, to look Pharaoh in the face and say something like that to him would have been a death penalty. Moses said, no, no, no. Uh-uh. We're not worried about that. There may be some fear, but I've got a God who showed me great and mighty signs. I've got a brother standing by me that God has given me to bolster my courage. And I'm going to go in. I'm going to look Pharaoh straight in the face. And I'm going to take courage and do what God has told me to do. You get David the shepherd boy with his sling facing Goliath. David didn't have to do that. Nobody went to him and said, David, I'm picking you to go out and fight Goliath. David, the little squirt, however old he was. I don't know how old he was, but he was old enough to have been Saul's armor bearer. He was old enough to have carried around that stuff and played harp for Saul. And he comes back, and he hears what Goliath is saying. He tells his brother, hey, what's going on? Why don't, Eliab, man, big brother, why don't you go fight that guy? I'm like, oh, shut up, little kid. Get out of here. Why come? Get out. Why go back home with the sheep? Man, you know how older brothers get when younger brothers point them out? My brother never did, of course. He got so defensive. David goes, hey, what's, hey, what's the matter with you, man? I'm just, hey, it's, it's a bad guy. Good guys got to kill bad guys. That's what he's telling him. And he goes around, and David finally gets, finally gets around to Saul. And goes, David's smart here. He does. He says, hey, what's going to happen to the guy that kills him? Catch that? Yeah, yeah. David's, David's not just doing it purely for uh, just getting rid of the bad guy. He wants to see what the benefit is, too. And then he finds out that Saul's going to give him his daughter to be wife. He's like, yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that girl. Yeah, she's about my age. Yeah, yeah. She's pretty, too. <laughs> this might be a good thing. And uh, Saul goes, David goes out there, and David goes to Saul, and Saul tries to give him armor. And David's like, I can't do this. I've never fought an armor before. And he goes out with just a sling and a staff, just a sling and a staff, and faces down a warrior who is way taller than everybody else, way bigger and way stronger. The weight that he was carrying was tremendous, and he fights in that. And he goes out and faces that guy, Goliath, and he goes and tells Goliath there, he says, thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast to fight. Because that's all David needed. All he needed was to know that he was there for the right cause, for the right reason, for the right person, and he had all the confidence in the world. Everybody else, including Big Brother, was back in the tent, including King Saul, head and shoulders of everybody else, back in the tent, shivering in fear, not wanting to face Goliath, when the little teenager goes out with his shepherd's sling and takes care of business. He swings that sling round and round and slings that stone, hits Goliath right in the forehead. We read it yesterday. That stone sunk into his forehead. Goliath fell, falls down on his face, and David runs up to him like, what do I do now? It says David didn't have a sword. It's like, I don't have a sword. What? I mean, oh, ooh, Goliath's got a sword. He pulls that big, huge, long sword out, cuts off Goliath's head, carries that head around with him the rest of the day. Why? Because when you have some courage to face these difficulties and face giants, God does miraculous things. Think of the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer single-handedly attacking the Philistine garrison two against 20. The Philistine said, come up to us and we'll show you a thing. Jonathan says, here we come and we might show you a thing or two as well because we're coming with a great big God. Now see this, two guys just deciding they're going to trust God enough to go up and face 20 Philistine soldiers. And they weren't sent. Saul didn't even know where they were. The people didn't know where they were, but they saw something that needed done, and they decided we're going to have the courage to go out and do what needs done. And they had a great victory that day. As Jonathan went through with his sword slashing and stabbing and poking and, and chopping, the armor bearer came behind and made sure everybody was dead behind them. They had each other's backs there. Last thing here, Acts 28, 15. Acts 28, 15. Look, there's, there is a need. There is a need for people to be courageous. There's a need for people to step outside of their comfort zone and not let fear keep them from, do what doing what is, what is right, from doing what is right. God is the one who does the work. He can't fail. We all agree with that statement, but it's hard to implement it. It's something I have to remind myself all the time. We just got to, you know, the, the statement, just step out by faith. Just step out by faith. Just step out. That's what this is. God's the one who does the work. He can't fail. Just go do it. Yeah, it's a lot easier to say it than to do it, though. It takes courage to do those things. Others need us to be courageous. There's a great work for God that needs done and can't be done unless we do it. God is always looking for a man. And the last thing, Acts chapter 28 and verse number 15, says, And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appy Forum in the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. Acts 28, 15. I'm not there. I'll just leave it there. This is the story of the Apostle Paul on his way to Rome. He's been a prisoner. He's been on a ship. He's been through so much difficulty and trials in his life. 
that would be hard to imagine. He even told a lot of the difficulties he went through uh, when, he was, when he was talking in, in one of the epistles. And uh, things that you wouldn't want to go through one of them, but he went through all of them. And he's there. They're at this, this place called the Three Taverns, kind of a crossroads. And when some of the believers heard he was there, they came. And they met him and the people with him. Luke was more than likely with him since Luke was writing this down. And when Paul saw them and talked to them, he thanked God and took courage. You know why he didn't take courage? Because the end is near. I'll just tell you right now, and I don't know when God's coming back, but it's got to be soon. No, I understand the disciples thought the same thing. All right. But whether it's in two minutes or two days or two years or 20 years, God's coming soon. And every day you get up and you're faced with fearful situations. Can you imagine having to make a decision? Oh, and it's a tough one. Oh, and I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen. You say, no, we know what's right. Honey, we're going to do this because it's the right thing to do. And we know this is what God wants us to do. And you make the decision, and the trumpet sounds. Man, can you imagine getting to heaven right after making a decision like that? Out of faith, courage, strength, and standing before God after having courage in a decision? We don't know when God's coming back. Now, can you imagine the flip side? Yeah, I know it's the right thing to do, but I don't know if I keep my job. I really like to eat. Um, well, yeah, okay, let's just, um, let's just, let's just do it. We just won't tell anybody. I mean, it'll just keep it on the down low. Right, right, telling God. We'll keep it on the, there's God, down low. <laughs> Can you imagine these things? Courage. Courage. Revelation 21, 8. Let's go there. This goes right into this. This is, this is the flip side here. Many of you know this. It's a great soul winning verse. It's a list of list of people that are going to have their part in the lake of fire. Now, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior and you are saved, none of these things will send you to hell because they're washed in the blood of the Lamb. But these are the people that hell is going to be full of. And let's look at the first one on the list. It says, but the fearful it, it always seemed kind of funny to me that that would be on it like wow that's that's with the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars i mean now we talk about hey have you yeah you, 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 and it says in all liars you've told a lie right yeah okay see you're on the list I might just might ask him hey have you ever been fearful Yeah. <laughs> it's just God giving us a glimpse into what he's pleased with and not pleased with. So we go through the Bible and we have a list of people who took courage. And there's a list of people who out of fear didn't do what God wanted him to do. Take Moses' brother Aaron. When Moses was up on the mountain, he was fearful of the people. As the people came to him and told them, take us back to Egypt, make us gods. And instead of taking a stand... And doing what was right, he, cow- he was a coward and in fear told the people, give me your golden earrings. And he made them a golden calf to worship. Why? Because he was scared. He's afraid. And then you get the people of Israel fearful of crossing into Canaan because of the giants and wanting to stone Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. And none of those people got to see the promised land. They all wandered in the wilderness till they died. You get the servant, Matthew 25, who being fearful, hid his talent in the earth. And because of it was cast into outer darkness because he was so scared of what the master would think if he failed that he hid his talent and didn't even try to do what the master would want him to do to make some money for the master. Then you get the story of Peter. After saying he would die with Christ, denying him three times, all because he was afraid of what people would think of him. You get John Mark, most scholars believe, turns back and leaves the mission field because of fear. Now, you take these people here, especially Peter and John Mark. You know what Peter was doing 50 days later? He was preaching Pentecost, seeing 3,000 people saved and baptized. You know what John Mark did later on in life? 
He left. The Apostle Paul and Barnabas, they split, argued over John Mark. We're not taking that quitter with us. Barnabas like, I'm taking him with me. Paul's like, I'm not going with you then. We're splitting up. Man, Paul was so mad, so upset. I think he's a, I think he's a pretty passionate guy. And uh, later on, you're reading the, one of the epistles, said, send John Mark to me for he's profitable unto me. You see, we all have moments of fear. So it's not about what happened yesterday or the day before or this morning or last year or last week. All this starts now and says, what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen this next week? How am I going to treat my family on Tuesday? How am I going to treat my family as I go to visit them this next summer? How am I going to treat my fellow employees? How am I going to treat my boss? How am I going to approach a situation? How am I going to face these things here? You see, sour, Satan is, walks about as a roaring lion. We read in Ephesians chapter 6. And the Bible tells us, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. We are to take a stand because the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Satan devours Christians every day like cupcakes. I got this. this somebody was talking about that. That's a good illustration. Cupcake Christians. Cupcake Christians. You know, cupcake Christians... Uh, a cupcake Christian is the Christian who doesn't come out for fear of the sun melting its frosting. And it stays in a sealed container for fear of drying out. It stays in a comfortably cooled environment because the heat is uncomfortable. And I'll tell you what, Satan loves cupcakes. He's walking about devouring cupcake Christians with doubt, with fear, with insecurity, with anxiety. Fear is one of Satan's biggest weapons <laughs> against Christianity. And the only thing that can get you through is courage, because courage is what brings us through. Courage is what comes from, the faith, from faith in God and God's provision. It is he that works in us, not ourselves. Courage comes from a confidence in God, knowing that God will always see us through. Now this week, and the next six weeks, we've got a challenge that our church has set out there. And the whole lesson tonight was because of this. So let me ask you, what are you going to do in the next six weeks that are going to take some courage? Something that is completely out of your comfort zone. Something that you've never done before that you can say, okay, God, I know you want me to do this. I know you'd be happy with me if I did this, but I usually don't because I'm just a little bit fearful of the situation. Let me ask you this. Where's your courage? Where's your courage? Where's your courage? You see, I've never gone out on a Saturday soul winning before. Well, this Saturday, we're going to have a one-hour soul winning bus. It'll leave at 10, be back at 11. You can go out and do the rest of your business that day, and you think, what would I do? This sounds so scary. Yes, but are you going to let fear keep you from doing what God wants you to do? You don't even have to go say anything. We'll put you with somebody, and they'll do all the talking. You can just go around and be the silent partner in the praise. There's all sorts of things you can do. Some of you, it's, it's a little difficult. I mean, you're trying to figure out time to, time to read your Bible. And the only time you have is at lunch break at work. But you're a little afraid of what your coworkers will think of you if you get your Bible out at lunch break and you sit there and read your Bible. Hey, let's, let's take that little bit of step of courage and let's go do something this week for God. Some of you think, I don't know, I don't know, I have, I have much time. I haven't talked to any of my coworkers. I don't know if they go to church and I'm a little worried about what they think of me if, if they knew I was a Christian. Well, how about you take some tracks to work this week and you just leave them around the, leave them around the break room. Leave them, where, leave them somewhere. They may not even know it. You are the one who gave it to them. Do something that's a little bit courageous this week. Those of you that go out regularly, there's things you can do that are courageous too. There's things you can do. There's people you haven't talked to yet. There's new doors you can knock on. Some of you, your courage might be, hey, you know what? We're going to stay out till 2 o'clock today on the bus route. Take an extra hour and a half to go door knocking and soul winning. You think, oh, I don't want to do that. Well, nobody wants to do that, <laughs> It's, it's not, not, not hard to understand, but it's going out and doing something that God wants us to do. It's going out and taking the things that God would be pleased with us doing and taking six weeks and saying, let's have a little bit more courage than we've had in the past and go out and do something that's a little uncomfortable. I remember there used to be some men go down to the movie theater and do street preaching at the movie theater. Not in the movie theater, outside, and everybody's lined up. They just get up there on the curb and start preaching all those. Any of you ever go down there? Any of you? I, I never did. I was too fearful. All right. But there's all sorts of things you could do. Uh, you go to a park. You may, you may find a park. Just We're going to drive around until we find a group of people, and we're going to go. And <laughs> Come on, teenagers, do it. Take the challenge here. I'll drive you. I'll let you do it. I'll sit in the car. Go there and find a group of people and just tell them, hey, look, there's a ledge right there. Just go stand on that ledge with the track and hold it up and say, hey, let me tell you all something that God tells us about in his word. And they'll stare at you like they've never seen anybody like you before because they haven't. And go through the gospel with them. See what happens. 
Oh, I don't know. That sounds kind of scary. Yeah, it is a little scary. But if the right courage in your heart, you might be able to have some fun doing it too. Because courage is what brings you through the fearful times, the insecure times, the anxious times, and the times of doubt. Let me ask you, what are you going to do these next six weeks? What are you going to do these next six weeks? They're going to push the comfort zone a little bit. They're going to help you do something a little bit more. And there's lots of things. Here's what I want you to do. I want you all individually to go home or here at the invitation. Go to God and say, God, would you show me something that you want me to do these next six weeks? And help me have the courage to do it. I wonder how much more we would do for our community if we had the courage to step it up just a little bit these next six weeks and do something for God. Father, thank you for all you've done. Thank you for loving us, for giving us a book that we can learn so much from. Thank you for the love you've shown to us. Thank you for the faithfulness of so many people here who are so busy. And I pray that you'd help us today to make some decisions to, to do a little bit more, to step a little bit outside the comfort zone. Maybe there's some people in here who have never witnessed to anybody before. You're comfortable giving tracks out, but you've never taken that next step of giving the gospel and witnessing. Maybe that's that step of courage. Maybe there's somebody here who's never passed out a gospel track before, and, and that's that first step of courage they need to take is get that track, and whether they're at the store or at work or, or walk down the street, find somebody and, and just hand it to them and say, here, I want to invite you to our church. Maybe the next step of courage is going to be somebody who should be teaching, is ready to teach, could teach, but just a little bit fearful of if they do a good job or not. Maybe that's the next step for some people. Maybe some people worried about some things that they know you want them to do, but they're a little bit afraid of what their family would think. And God, I pray that you'd give us the courage, that you'd strengthen us, and that you'd help us to make these decisions for you. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let's stand together. We're going to have an invitation. As the instruments play, you can come forward, use an altar. You know, in my life, I struggle with a lot of things. The same thing. Just having the courage to step out and do some more. Might be good to go to God and say, God, I'm sorry for being fearful in situations. I know I shouldn't be, but I am a human being. And I have been fearful. And I probably will be again, but I want to do better for you. You need to get salvation taken care of. You don't know for sure when you die, you go to heaven. It'd be a great time to come forward now. We have men up here that could talk to you and show you from the Word of God or ladies up here. And uh, if you'd like to get baptized tonight, baptistry is up there, ready to go. Brother Ted, we are having a, we are having a baptism tonight. God, thank you for everything you've done. Your blessings are beyond number. We take, I mean, there's so many blessings you've given us, we take them for granted.